Hey there, this is Dan, you're watching the Salty Sea, and I'm here with the second of my two guides to the Blood Hunt box set. This time I'm covering the Askergan True Blades, one of the coolest lore warbands out there in that they've got the soul-blight curse of vampirism, but through the power of discipline and Buddhism, they've uh, managed to control it a little bit, although you can see here not quite all of them have done so. Really exciting stuff, and I'm going to start with the leader. Let's see, Askergan Exemplar. I really like a few things about this leader. The first is that he's sort of self-contained. He can just move around the board, do a ton of damage. You just keep a double on him for Onslaught, and then just set him loose wherever you want. On his own, with regular stats, he's pretty on par with a lot of bespoke leaders around this points value. But what I do think sets him apart is the fact that each of those attacks is so high impact that he just combos better with Onslaught than any of the other leaders do, which is a really nice thing to have. So let's take a look at some of the things you can do with Onslaught with him, right? You get a 72% chance to one-shot kill a Toughness 5, 10 wound model. That's a really big deal. He also has a really great chance at two-hit killing rival bespoke leaders. So you can't put your Claws of Karanak leader, the Pack Lord, you cannot put it into combat with him at the end of a round because if you lose the initiative and the Askergan Exemplar gets to go first, he'll just delete your Pack Lord off the board and you'll lose 205 points for nothing. That's a really nice ability to have for your leader to be able to threaten that. And so that's something I really like about this guy. This is something where if you buy this Warband or if you buy the Blood Hunt set, but you end up not really liking the playstyle or just something about the full group doesn't really speak to you, the Exemplar is going to remain a really interesting option as an ally for other death factions for a long time because he moves 5 inches, that's something that they like, and he has all this damage. Really, there's only one fighter in all of death that I think does what he does better, and that's Stalker's. But Stalkers aren't heroes. You can't ally them in to anything other than Osiarch Bone Reapers. So if you're interested in something that would do some of what a Stalker would do, and you're not in Osiarch Bone Reapers, this is your guy. And that's a really nice option to have that Death Warbands didn't have before. And so that's great. This is Even if it was just this guy coming in through this release, this would be a really awesome addition to Death players uh, all throughout the Grand Alliance. Luckily, we've got some more stuff here other than just the hero. So let's take a look at their abilities. <clears throat> they have one ability, and it's called Onslaught. You add one to the attack's characteristic of melee attack actions made by this fighter until the end of their activation. Now, I know a lot of warbands have this ability. Some people have even told me that all warbands have this ability. But it's much better on the True Blades than it is anywhere else. Uh, if I have to stop memeing for a second, we can say that they do have some interesting ones around here, like Terrifying Howl. This is one where, until the end of the battle round, enemy fighters within three inches of your cursed blood cannot make reactions. Most warbands in the game don't react that often, but the ones that do get a lot of mileage out of it. And so things like the Switcheroo factions, like Fire Slayers or Gloomspite Gits, or Skaven, those are ones where one fighter can give up their action as a reaction to give a bonus move to another fighter, something like that. Or you have the kind of nullify crit or minus one attack factions, all of the ones that drastically reduce incoming damage. In those cases, Terrifying Howl will increase your damage output quite a bit compared to what say onslaught would if they if your opponent can just um, blow up your damage output with a reaction magisterial poise is the same ability that the claws of karanak have on a triple now it's a little bit better here i think than it is in corn partly because it's not competing with quite so many things but also because these fighters have fewer attacks, but the same total damage. Each attack has more damage per attack, and so the Magisterial Poise is just going to get you a lot more mileage, a lot more total damage than it would coming out of corn. And so I think that that's a pretty big deal. 
Uh, the reaction is just plus one toughness. Every once in a while, that'll be okay, but you're not going to use it very often. Now let's actually get into the fighters. I like the pariah a lot. Mobility and durability can be a really useful combination. 18 wounds for 105 points is really solid, especially for move 5. Now, a spoiler alert, I actually didn't end up including the Pariah in any of my builds, but that's not because I think it's bad. Uh, I actually do think that the, that the Pariah is pretty solid. Uh, one note about the ability on the Pariah. Beast Familiar, pick an enemy fighter within 20 inches of this fighter. Until the end of the battle round, that fighter cannot make disengage actions. Perhaps that's going to be good in this warband. I can say that people who play Corvus Cabal, people who play Zinch, uh, other factions that have this ability, they tend not to really use it. They tend to think that this ability is pretty bad. So I'm not bullish on the ability. I think it's probably going to be pretty bad. But just so you know, he does have it. The Acolytes are the 90-point fighters. And I think that either build here is pretty reasonable. The reason that I would go with the Throat Taker is one, the Acolyte with the Bone Hilt Falchion, Falchion. Those are really good if you're using Onslaught. That's the theme of this warband. But I am going to be spending my Onslaught dice on the higher impact fighters. Things like the Ascetics. Things like my wonderful Exemplar over here. And so I'm probably not going to have doubles left when it comes down to the Acolytes. That said, it's still pretty reasonable. You get a decent bonus in terms of your damage compared to what a Throat Taker would get. Now, what I like about the Throat Taker is the 3-inch reach here. You don't sacrifice that much damage. I mean, you do if you're willing to use Onslaught on the Falchion. But if you're not willing to use Onslaught, then the Throat Taker is not really that much less damage. I like having four strength in sort of these small three inch three attack fighters because the job here is really just to get one or two damage in to just take out fighters who were left on just a couple health so that your big guys can get freed up to do other things. Think of them as doing what archers used to be able to do that they can't really do as well anymore because they can't shoot into combat from far away. This is the three inch reach sort of version of that where you go in and, and uh, babysit your big high impact fighters. Now let's talk about the ascetics. This is another one where I think both builds are pretty interesting. So I prefer the charnel mace even though I usually recommend people use the more range versions. The reason I like the charnel mace is that at this point, with how impactful these attacks are, you probably are interested in using Onslaught all the time. And if you are, man, 6, 3, 4 is absolutely crazy. Now, for those who maybe don't do the math a lot, it might seem like, oh, 2, 5 versus 3, 4, those sort of total to the same number. But the reason why 3, 4 is so much more impactful than 2, 5 is you have strength 6. You are expecting to hit on threes. So though that extra damage in the regular hits and one less damage on crits, that extra damage on the regular hits just comes up way more often. And so that, in my opinion, makes the Charnel Mace really, really interesting. It's also a nice little Stormcast killer. It'll just tear through Toughness 5. Uh, the modal outcome is 6, so that's what's going to happen the most often. The average is... D is uh, the DPA five, right? The average is six and a half, but you're going to do six and seven a lot. Now, three is also common. Sometimes you will essentially whiff, but six and seven are very, very likely. And then every once in a while, you'll spike with a uh, bigger number, something like that, especially when you're using Onslaught. If you don't have any Stormcast or Iron Jaws or Slaves to Darkness or OCR Bone Reapers or Cities of Sigmar in your meta, then I think you take the Glaive because that one less strength to strength five doesn't hurt as much and then you kind of like having that two inch range. But man, I just named some of the most popular factions in the game <laughs> when I just did that. So that's why I think I would go with the mace is because that plus one strength there is going to be a really big deal against, again, some of the most popular factions in the game. 
Now, finally, let's get to the Cursed Blood. There's a lot to like here for the Cursed Blood because you're getting mobile staying power, which is something that has become a lot more important in second edition than it was in first edition. Uh, so you can, because you have 25 health instead of 20, which is almost everything around this points range in this roll, they almost all have 20 wounds. But that extra five points of health is actually pretty good at keeping it alive to make sure that it gets to attack. For example, if you remember the exemplar, it's incredibly good at killing 20 wound things in just two attacks, uh, just one activation. If it ends combat in, you know, if it ends a round in combat with them, the next round it'll kill them. That's not quite as true with the Curse Blood. And in fact, doing 25 damage in one round is just weirdly in this game a lot harder than doing 20 damage. Um, sort of the way that attack profiles tend to line up, it's actually quite difficult to do 25 damage at once. And so that's really nice for this fighter. Now, one thing that it does kind of suffer from is there's some tough comparisons, especially in Night Haunt, actually. The Knight of Shrouds is the same points, five fewer wounds, but and one less strength, so just much worse at fighting. But you get the Fly Room Mark and the Res ability. I would probably lean towards the Cursed Blood most of the time in that comparison, but some people love resurrecting. And if you do, also there's the Cruel Gast Cruciator, which is 15 more points, so a little bit less in the same neighborhood, but close enough that it's worth at least comparing. Because it's 15 more points, and you get the exact same defensive profile with that 25 wounds, but you also get your Resurrect ability, your Fly keyword, and a pretty solid shooting profile. And the Cruciator recently got the major buff that it can now shoot into combat, which is something it could never do before. And so it's a lot better than it used to be. So the Cursed Blood is good, very interesting, very usable, but there are going to be situations where you are maybe tempted to bring in a Night Haunt hero, um, depending on what you want out of the Warband. So let's get into some builds with the True Blades. And the first one I'm going to do is just one box of the True Blades and then just getting some Sons of Velmorn. The Sons of Velmorn are an Underworld's Warband that is essentially the Graveguard tribal <laughs> Underworld's Warband. It's a, uh, a King's Leader type of guy, 160 points for King Morlack Velmorn. He's a decent, decent fighter in his own right. But what you're really taking it for is these three cheap Graveguard that just hit way above their weight class in terms of just point for point efficiency. And that's something where the True Blades, they're running around at five inch move all over the place, but their combat stats are not necessarily as great as some of the slower fighters. And so this way, they're still very, very good at running around between objectives, getting to where they need to go, but you have this sort of pack of very cheap, but very impactful guys um, with these three Grave Guard that you can include here and plus their, their one leader. And so that can be really nice. The other thing that Sons of Elmorn give you is the ability to resurrect at full health. Uh, King Morlack can resurrect them at full health because King Morlack technically counts as Soulblight Gravelords, has the ability to get that resurrect ability, and then uh, these were not grandfathered into the FAQ, so these still come back at full health. They do not have the elite rune mark. This is a really solid list really scary list because it takes what the Askergan True Blades do well and it just kind of compresses that into two-thirds of your list and then gives you another way to make up for those problems or the things that it doesn't do well with the rest of your list and that's really nice. Here I would still go with an Exemplar and two Aesthetics because those are going to be using the Onslaught while your, while your Underworld's fighters don't. Now, you can do a pretty similar setup to that, but being a little bit more true to what the True Blades like to do, if you want. So this is what I would say really leaning into the Onslaught uh, combos is. And this is with two Exemplars, the leader, three Acolytes with Throat Takers, and then one Acidic with the Charnel Mace, and then one Cruel Gas Cruciator. 
remember here that the Cruciator can shoot into combat, like I said before, and here you have three fighters who absolutely love having Onslaught, but unlike the last list, you're actually getting an extra Exemplar, which gives you even more impact. Then these Throat Takers, if you remember what I said before, they just kind of babysit your heavy hitters, pick off anything that you accidentally left on one or two wounds, and you know, that three inch reach lets them position behind the leader to still cover the entire leader um, because these bases are not particularly large. And the other thing I like here is you just have a very simple dice plan. You have one triple that you're really, really excited to use. You have one double, again, that you're really, really excited to use because Onslaught is so good with this warband. And then you have Rampage if you ever get a quad, which again, you're very excited to use because Exemplars are great Rampagers. Uh, the Cruciator is kind of an underrated Rampager because you can move somewhere and then shoot three times. So you can actually get your three attacks in, but really far across the board at 16 inches threat range there. So even though there's not a ton of different abilities to use, they're all really good. And so you don't have to think very hard about it <laughs> while still getting big value. Uh, one thing I noticed for a lot of the top lists in the tournament that I ran, they had a lot of different abilities that they had access to at all times. And that's been a theme of a lot of really good lists that aren't just based on one completely absurd broken fighter profile. Those are very exhausting to play against or play with, play as and against. This, even though you only have three abilities that you care at, care about, all of them are incredibly impactful, so you just have no, no issue just reserving things to that and just not having to think very hard about it, which is great. If you really want to stay with the True Blades here, you can play a Cursed Blood and turn an Acolyte into a Pariah. So, you know, drop the uh, Cruciator, turn an Acolyte into a Pariah, and then you get to use the whole thing and just... That's what it would look like if you had two exemplars. Finally, I want to <laughs> I want to give you a somewhat silly uh, True Blades list. This is honestly really a Soul Blight Grave Lords list because you're using the two Soul Blight Grave Lords um, <laughs> Underworlds Warbands, but this is kind of showing you what the exemplar can achieve as an ally. Of just this is the mobile damage platform that just is completely self-contained. The two Underworlds Warbands here have a lot of tricks that they pull off on their own, and they have incredibly efficient chaff. Uh, both, both the Exiled Dead and uh, the Sons of Velmorn are just very, very points efficient. And so then you just have your Exemplar in here as this independent operator, and it can be really effective. So I hope those uh, give you some ideas. Here, we'll go to the uh, more true True Blades lists. Uh, I hope those give you some ideas of things you can do with this faction, and I hope you have a ton of fun with them. I think uh, from a sort of competitive and casual standpoint, competitively, they have a little bit more to work with than the Claws of Karanak do. Casually, I think actually they have a little bit less to work with because uh, the abilities are not as interesting to build around. But... Um, I think a lot of people are really high on this aesthetic and there's just a lot of tools here that you sort of have at your disposal to uh, create something pretty powerful on the board. And so I think there's a lot to like there. Uh, I'm going to be putting out more Warcry videos soon. So until then, may all your rolls be crits.